oh man, we've got a good giveaway for you today. So check this out, right? So it's January, one of the biggest months of the year for fitness. Everybody wants to get in shape. So what we did is probably the biggest promotion we've ever done in the history of Mind Pump. We created three workout bundles. So the bundles all include different workout programs. Each one gives you about nine months of exercise programming. We created a bundle for beginners, one for intermediate lifters, and one for advanced lifters. And that's what's going on this month, and they're all on sale, and they're really cool. But right now, I'm going to give away the Extreme Fitness Bundle. This is the advanced bundle for free to one of you lucky viewers, and here's how you can enter to win. Leave a comment below in the first 24 hours that we drop this episode. Subscribe to this channel and turn on your notifications. you got to do all those things. If we pick your comment, we'll notify you, and you'll get free access to nine months of exercise programming for advanced lifters. Now, everybody else, if you want to get one of these bundles, they're discounted heavily. I mean, massively. You're probably you're looking at like 70-something percent over the retail of all the programs that are included in these bundles. So it's a huge discount. Again, if you're interested, head over to the website is mapsjanuary.com. That's where you'll find the bundles. Also, if you've never tried one of our workout programs, uh, I suggest you start with Maps Anabolic. It's a single program. It's the flagship program. It's about 12 weeks of exercise programming, very effective for general strength, muscle building, metabolism boosting. That program is 50% off right now. You can find that at mapsred.com and then use the code January50 for that half off discount. All right, here comes the show. Lifting to failure is probably killing your gains. Ooh, uh, let's boy, you get to piss some people off. Boy, are we just on this kick right now just to offend everybody? I right? know. We're like, punching everybody in the gut. We well, got all the cardio queens after us right now on YouTube. Cardio queen. Oh, now now you're going to get all the, the bodybuilder intensity, yeah. you know, failure guys that are getting spotting uh, spots on every one of their lifts. Yeah. Like, you're going to piss all them off. No, you know, here's There's a, a study that shows this. I know. Okay, so here's the deal. For, mm -hmm. First off, to explain failure lifting, what that means is you lift the weight until you fail, right? You can't lift the weight anymore. Now, there's a, always a debate. Do you fail on technique and form, or do you fail when you just can't move the weight anymore? Whatever. Either way, um, it's too much intensity most of the time for most people. That's the problem. And there are studies that show that there's benefits. But studies are always you know, 8 to 12 weeks long. Temporary. Exactly. And if when you train to failure, it is not – even though you reduce the volume – uh, of your training to make up for that intensity, it really does fry the body in a different way. Well, it, when we talked about the workout partner thing, uh, this is kind of what came to mind for me because I do, I wish I remember the exact study, but I do remember reading a study that talked about the benefits of training to failure mm -hmm. and uh, and its benefits as far as muscle growth. Mm -hmm. And after reading that, that, that's all I needed to hear. Like, okay, I need to be doing negatives <clears throat> and a workout partner who's taking me to failure. And this entire modality is devoted to just like ramping that intensity up to a really high level. Yeah, right? and so it was. I was stuck in this kind of trap for a very long time. At least a decade of training uh, looked like. Uh, every exercise that I did, um, I definitely did at least one set, if not every set, to failure. Um, and you know, if I wasn't struggling, then I didn't get a good workout. That mm -hmm. was my thought process, and that's also why I used to think that a workout partner was so valuable. Was you know, the only way I could take this thing to failure every time is if I got someone to yep. to help me out. And, yeah. And now, it, now the truth is that the failure training does and can produce some pretty significant results. The problem is nobody programs it properly um, and failure training should be used appropriately. And I would argue by people who really understand technique, form, stability, and know their bodies. Because when you go to failure, the risk of injury does go up. That's just the bottom line. Just the amount of intensity th that you're putting your body through. Because here's the thing when you train to failure, if you don't ever do it and you try it, it's further than you think. Like you'll get to a rep and be like, oh my God, I think I have one more. Then you'll do it and be like, oh my God, I have another one. And you'll keep going. And when your form starts to break down, oftentimes it's the weak link that breaks down, which dramatically increases the the, the risk of injury. And, and for most people going to failure, not only is it not necessary, but it tends to set them back. And, and so with clients, I mean, let me ask you guys this, with your clients, did you ever train when you were good? At, but forget when you sucked as a trainer, when you started getting good. <laughs> did you ever train clients to failure? No, ever? No, no, rarely ever. Do you guys remember what it was that shattered your paradigm? I remember. It was actually when I, because I had no interest really in 
powerlifting or Olympic lifting, and I really didn't follow that. That's yeah. probably more Justin and maybe even you. Yeah. Um, that I didn't really pay attention to their programming and training until way later, and I was shocked that the strongest people in the world, yeah. like, never trained to failure. I yep. mean, like, literally, hardly ever trained to failure. Like, they're trained, and not only that, like but sixty to seventy percent. Yeah, intensity. their their intensity was even way way. It was, you talk about the we talk about uh, two reps in the tank all the time, yep. right? So we 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 promote that. Like, that's what most people should train for is having two reps left in the tank in their sets. And that's like what Olympic lifters and powerlifters train like 80% of the time. It's not until they get like to their peak or getting ready to get into a meet. Yep. Do they test those limits, you know? And I, I thought that was so crazy. And I was like, how funny is this that you have all these weekend warriors or gym bros that are lifting and we're all using spotters and you got this, man, you got this. And we're training this way. And yet the the strongest, most muscular People on the planet, when you talk about you know, power lifters and Olympic lifters, are never training that way. Or like you're talking about, a five percent of the time they are are training this way. It completely just yeah, shattered you, my paradigm. You tend to hear yeah. training to failure from bodybuilders, but even if we use, and, and I, you know, I don't necessarily like using bodybuilders or elite athletes as examples because what we're dealing with is a very it's a very rare, um, you know, portion of the population with genetics that are on the extreme end. I mean, it's really no different than people who are over seven feet tall. It's so rare in real life. You know, you walk around in real life. You know, you never see anybody that's over seven feet tall. That's how rare the type of genetics are. Well, that, it's not just that either, though, Sal. I mean, when you're talking about that community, uh, a big portion of them, especially the ones that look amazing, are on anabolics. Then you throw that on top and of then, it. And then I tell you what, one of the biggest things that I noticed uh, from taking testosterone for as long as I did, uh, the one of the best things was the recovery ability. Of course. I mean, strength, yeah, that's cool, but you're eventually your body kind of adapts to that and you start hitting your peaks yeah, anyways. Yeah, you throw shit at your body and you don't really get sore. Yeah, and I, and I don't really get that sore anymore. So that it's not like strength just keeps going up forever as long as you're on you know steroids. What was amazing, though, was the recovery ability. Yes. Was that I could throw anything at my body and destroy it, and my body had this ability to recover yes, and get but back. Yes, but uh, genetics, the extreme genetics plus that, right. produces this insane uh, situation. And so taking advice from that, you know, category of people, you have to be very careful. I would say you'll get some answers if you look at all of them and kind of look at trends, but you're not going to get a, all the answers. But here's some clues, right? If you look at the pro bodybuilders, the the, 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 the elite top muscle building people with the best genetics and of course on anabolics, and you look at the ones that train with the failure intensity model, what you tend to see is a high rate of injury. You tend to see, I mean, the most popular being Dorian Yates, right? Dorian Yates trained what he called heavy duty style training, where, or excuse me, not heavy duty, blood and guts was the name of his style of training. Drive it on! Oh, squeeze it down! Make it do nothing. Make it do nothing. Hold it there! Hold it there! Let's do more! Make it do nothing! Make it do nothing! Make it do nothing! But it was borrowed off of heavy duty, which was invented by Mike Menser. And he had lots of injuries, right? Ronnie Coleman. trained with an incredible intensity, right? Mm -hmm. Tremendous amounts of injuries. Then you have bodybuilders that didn't train that way who had a lot of longevity. Dexter um, Jackson. Dexter Jackson being a great example of uh, of a bodybuilder. But, you know, so the risk of injury is very high. It does fry your central nervous system. It really does. Um, and the CNS needs time to recover, um, just like muscles do, if not more so. Now, I if I see a program with failure programmed in properly – then I would say this is good, but I never see that. I never see failure programmed improperly. Oh, right. It's almost <clears throat> always either the feature of the program, mm -hmm. or 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 somehow it's the feature. You know where they talk about intensity and how hard how hard do you need to train. Um, but no, yeah, intensity is important, but going to failure is too much for most people. And now, when did it change for me? I'll tell you, it changed for me. I want to say late twenties, maybe, um, and up until then, like you, I trained to failure quite often. I did the body part split, the whole thing, and then I started reading 
these old strength books that were written by people in the ni- early 1900s. And I noticed they all trained full body three days a week. They looked incredible. This is before supplements were even invented, really. Forget anabolic steroids. And I thought, and then what they would write about in these books was uh, make sure that you save some energy, the way that they put it, right? Because they didn't say failure. They said, make sure you have enough energy to train the next workout and don't, Mm -hmm. you know, essentially it would say, don't beat up your body. And so I took it as, okay, if I'm training my whole body three days a week, going to failure, I know is going to crush me. Yeah. What if I stopped a few reps short of failure and the gains I got were literally within the first week, I saw my strength start to go up. Well, that's why I had the biggest epiphany was like measuring more so on how my next workout felt. And, you know, there's this whole thing like, your your body needs to heal, right? And so at some point, uh, you know, there's the there's healing or adapting. Like, which one are you doing? There's a sweet spot there where if you're adapting and you go into your next workout, you feel stronger, you feel more energized. Mm-hmm. And if you've never felt that in a workout and you just felt almost dread, like you're grinding your way through every single workout, you got to assess, you know, that amount of uh, intensity you're bringing. Well, that's where it came full circle for me. So first it was seeing the programming from power lifters and Olympic lifters. Then I remember like the first couple of times that I took like a, like being very consistent, like in hardcore training, right. And training intensely. And then I took like a, a week vacation. Matter of fact, we used every July, we had this 10 day vacation. We go up wakeboarding and that was all I did. No, I wasn't lifting weights. I'm out in the trees and the lake, like, and then I'd come back, you know, worried. I'm going to be, oh, my God, I've, all I did was eat candy and sit on a lake and, you know, lay, lay out and stuff like that. No training whatsoever. Sure, I was doing a little bit of cardiovascular stuff by doing wakeboarding, but not any strength training at all. Oh, my God, I'm going to lose all the strength. And I come back stronger. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And that was kind of when it was like that, that whole thing came together for me. It's like, what the hell? And it's like, oh, wow, maybe my body really needed to <laughs> – fully recover like that. And now that I am fully recovered, the, my body is responding yeah. and I'm getting stronger. That was when it all started to come together. Yeah, now here's what's interesting with failure training. And this is where I think some people get sold. When you do it for a short period of time, you do gain strength and you do you can gain muscle in a very short period of time, but it's very short lived. Which well, that's where the studies are built around. Yes. That's the because if you were to Especially if you never train a failure and then you do it like for a couple weeks, you see like, oh my gosh, I'm getting stronger and building muscle very, very quickly. That happened to me as a kid when I first picked up Heavy Duty by Mike Menser. And I was like, for the for a month, I saw these crazy gains. And of course, it all stopped and plateaued completely. So as a long-term approach, it's really terrible. And again, I think it's just never programmed appropriately or properly. And when people use failure, they use it all the time. It's just all about intensity. And, and so one of my favorite things to do uh, as an older trainer when I started to get real good is if I had a guy hire me who had worked out for a long time and I'd look at their workouts and I'd see that they trained to failure all the time, I would confidently say to this to them, I'd say, oh, I'll, I'll get you 10 to 15 pounds stronger on most of your lifts within a month. And they'd look at me like I was crazy. And I'd say, I'll refund you if it doesn't happen. You know what I would do? Yeah. Just have them not train to failure. Yeah. Yeah. And then all of a sudden they'd see these crazy gains because <laughs> they were overdoing it before. You yeah. know, it's... it's um it's tough. It, it plays with the ego a little bit, right? Because I remember uh, lifting. I mean, and, and I'm still guilty of this, right? I think we all are a little bit where you have a workout and uh, and you can just feel the weight like moving so easy. And yeah. it's like, oh shit, this this 225, it's not a grind right now. It feels like it's moving up slow like, or uh, smooth. Oh, let me throw another quarter on there and see how that goes. And, and then all of a sudden you're like, whoa, I've never lifted this. It's a PR for you in your workout. And then what do you want to do the next week? PR again. Yeah. Well, if that was if that was the best I've ever done, I mean, what what could be next week be? So it's it, you know it running with, as fast as you can into a brick wall. It, yeah, I mean. that's really uh, so. Um, th- this isn't. I don't. I don't feel like this is us uh, pointing at everybody else and saying, "Oh, everybody's doing this wrong, and we're so right." Listen, I'm guilty of of doing this too. It's it's you know it's very uh, it feeds the ego when I when I get in there and get a lift and it's the the most I've ever done and it's very tempting to want to keep doing that yeah. to see to see where the end is and see wow how much stronger am I but. You know, and and initially you may see that you may actually be able to do that back to back weeks and see gains and go, oh my God, I am getting stronger. But it's really hard to do that and then go, okay, it's time for me to go the other direction. Like it's just, you're fighting with the ego. Yeah, totally. All right, I want to tell you guys about. I, I went on a. You know, how sometimes I go on a little bit of a rabbit hole on the internet and just research random stuff. <laughs> you and all those holes. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> yes, yeah. me and the rabbit holes. Yeah. I uh, so I did. I did that last night. I went down this rabbit hole learning about this pharmaceutical drug. And I did not know it existed, and I learned some very interesting things 
about it. So here, let me tell you first how I got there, right? So okay. yeah, what's the original yeah. search? Yeah, so you got to figure out. So I got to explain this because you're like, what the hell's wrong with you? So I was <laughs> just researching a lot about, and I have been, uh, and this is something I've researched in the past quite a bit, but now especially because, you know, I'm on TRT myself, so it's very, um, you know, it's in the back, it's in my mind all the time. So I'm researching hormone therapy, side effects, and what happens here, and what happens there, and what about this hormone and that hormone, and I learned about uh, the effects of prolactin. Uh, in the body. So I don't know if you guys are familiar with the hormone bro- prolactin. In women, it stimulates uh, lactation. Mm. And in men, it does a few things. But one of the things that it does is it creates the refractory period after orgasm. Okay. Huh? So okay, so there's this big difference. What's bet- a, what's a refractory period? What okay. So I'll, I'll, I'll explain, right? So a very interesting big difference physiologically, I guess, or behaviorally be- between men and women is that women, and this I, I, I told Jessica this is female privilege, so we had a nice discussion about this. <laughs> oh, well, <yeah. laughs> Big female privilege. This is a real female Triggered. privilege. Uh. Women can have multiple orgasms, like one after another. It's totally possible. Lots of women have experienced this. Did you know this, Doug? <laughs> yes, I'm aware of it. <laughs> Doug's, what's an orgasm? Yeah. So, <laughs> women can orgasm? Sorry, shot across the bow there. Yeah, sorry. No. yeah <laughs> I think so. You I'm going to keep my mouth you look, too right you look too comfortable over yeah. there. I had to shake you up a little bit. <laughs> He's got a, there's a picture. Of, there's, a, there's like a diagram. Please post the, the 40 old version fucking uh, yeah. front cover for right, that, right there. That's Make perfect, sure right you there. focus on this area, Doug. <laughs> yeah. So uh, women can have multiple orgasms, but mm. men rarely, it's super rare if a man can, right? A man has what's called a refractory period. He orgasms mm-hmm. and the hormone, we now know this, prolactin. And then we it, go to sleep. Yes, yeah. it comes. It, it, it comes. The pituitary produces a ton of it okay. immediately, causes your erection to go away. Yeah, you can't orgasm again, and you're done. You're over it. And you're so you telling me you found a supplement that we could take not it. a supplement. Uh, this okay. is a, it's a drug, and uh, no, I'm not encouraging people to take. Uh, okay, this. I was okay. like, well, this is interesting. And the reason why I got there was because uh, so hormone therapy uh, clinics will sometimes um, prescribe not just testosterone. But an uh, anabolic steroid called nandrolone. This is known as DECA. So DECA Dur- Durabolin is the yeah. trade name. Bodybuilders will call it. But it really, the, the chemical name is nandrolone. And TRT places will often, or not often, but sometimes prescribe it to men who want to improve their kind of joint function and feel on top of their testosterone. I just ordered it. Okay. So okay. I the, my last talk with Do- uh, Dodd, <laughs> Todd was exactly this. Oh, was yeah. I was telling, one of my complaints was, my joint pain, and he's and my estrogen. I don't know if we talked about this. We yet. did. Oh, yeah. did we talk about the yeah, show yeah, about yeah. my estrogen levels and everything? It was too low. Your, yeah, and one of the is. options I had was actually ordering Deca and trying that. I'm like, I would, yeah, absolutely. I'd yeah, love to try. So, and, and they do it low dose, and uh, uh, and you know when you do through a lab or whatever, and they test you for the whole thing. But but one of the side effects of using Nandrolone at high doses, not what you're going to be using. But at high doses, no, two to one is what he says. So right, two times testosterone, half of that will be yeah. Deca. So like a like two hundred. You know, so if I'm doing one cc of testosterone, which is what I'm on, half I'll be of half a cc exactly. of the, the deca. Yeah. So and now bodybuilders use way more. Obviously, yeah. bodybuilder doses of anabolic steroids and testosterone are you know ten times higher than what you would get at a hormone therapy place. And I don't know if you guys have heard this term in bodybuilding circles, deca dick. Have you heard of this before? Yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> This is this is a side I effect. When people will take a lot of nandrolone uh, to try and bulk up or whatever, build muscle, and then they'll be like, "I can't get an erection. Like, what the hell is going on?" And uh, you know, they used to think it was because of the conversion to estrogen. Even when they took anti-estrogens, they would have it. That's not what Todd explained to me. He <laughs> okay. explained to me it had something to do with like the body thinking that the uh, the deca is trying to create the testosterone, and it's not. Like testosterone is well, I'm not. That's, sh- uh, that's, I'm not sure. That's kind of like the, how the and that's what's happening. It makes them. I, so I don't know, but th- I'm telling you how I got to this uh, place okay. of research. Sorry, so then sorry. what I read yeah. is they it said it wasn't lactating porn. Yes, yeah. how you started. Okay. What I'm just kind? saying no. Yeah, like, I'm just saying. Did you go through my phone? I did. Okay, so so <laughs> so then I'm reading and and I don't know, but you know they would talk about deca dick, and I'm reading more mm-hmm. about you know anabolic steroids and side effects, and then you see these in these forums are saying sometimes people can get gyno. Not from estrogen, but from prolactin or prolactin side effects like they can't get erections or whatever. And then in these forums, they and this is what I guess this is the cool and maybe not so cool thing about bodybuilding circles. They're like the ultimate lab rats. They just experiment on themselves. Yeah. So apparently, some of these people are, are would get their hands on black market uh, cabergoline. I think it's pronounced or cabergoline. I've never hmm. heard of this. So this is an anti uh, prolactin drug. 
that is it's a dopamine agonist. So it increases dopamine and reduces prolactin in the body. And so it kind of offsets it. And then I read articles that before the invention of Viagra, porn stars would take this thing. They would take this and then do their porn shoots or whatever and, and be able to just have multiple orgasms. Men, multiple orgasms. Wow. Then I read a study where they gave More it to shots. where they gave it to men. And it, so it's being researched as a potential libido booster in both men and women. Oh, interesting. So yeah, and the, and then in the it was a small study, but the men in the study who had like some sexual dysfunction issues, taking it reported that they were able to orgasm many times in a row. And I was many like, times. Yes, I was like, what? Many is what? like more so than this three. Is the, the like if it's was... two, you say two. If it's three, it's three. But if it's more than that, it's I, I think more than one in a row is pretty miraculous for a guy. <laughs> yeah. yeah. No, no. Holy cow. So wait, okay. <laughs> okay, so this is like part of the hormone that's responsible for uh, m women producing milk? That's that, it's what it does but, in women. Okay, so- By now, the way, I'm not a hormone is, expert. So if I'm fucking this up, please I'm just don't. Trying, I'm just saying. trying to understand this, this <laughs> pathway here. Uh, it's so, so now they take this- drug that sort of emulates that but it's it, it, it for some reason in men it milks them a different way it, <laughs> <laughs> it, i understand this correctly I mean, kind of similar when you think about it, it kind of it triggers the male refractory period so it's what it'll it, it's and they've discovered this through using these drugs and through giving men more prolactin to see what happens if there's a, there's a longer periods between when they can get an erection and have you know an orgasm again and the answer seems to be yes. So what is it about Viagra that does something similar? No, Viagra doesn't do something similar. Viagra, well, no, if you ever taken Viagra, a lot of times you can come and go, go at it right after. You still have an erection afterwards. Well, that's different. So Viagra is a, it inhibits the enzyme that breaks down nitric oxide. So you just get easier erections, just, but it does nothing for yeah. libido. You just have a useful member. Yes, you know, it does nothing for libido. Yeah. What this drug has will do, will you, according will, to some are studies- Are you producing even more semen then? Yes. Also, oh, wow. from what I've read, wow. Oh, wow. It, yeah, no, mm. Pretty wild. Now, this led me down. That, that, Sounds fun. So, is as that, I'm reading this, I'm like, "What the? F this is crazy." Oh, by the way, I would not mess with a dopamine agonist for this purpose because messing with dopamine, dopamine is connected to impulsive behaviors like gambling, uh, cheating on your partner, overeating. So. I would imagine if you took if people mess with this drug, you might see some potential behavioral issues that could happen hmm. as a result. Uh, in fact, I read a couple people wrote, "Oh my god, I had to go off that drug. I developed a shopping addiction or what." I'm like, "Oh shit, this is not." <laughs> wow, that doesn't sound like a good. <laughs> so we're not promoting this. No, right? hell aren't, there, aren't there supplements? But it's freaking wild. But it sounds like a good time. It's aren't, wild. Aren't there yeah. supplements on the market that make claims of? Making your load bigger, <laughs> yeah, yeah, right? Uh, what's, I don't know what the politically correct way to say that, that. I don't or think scientific I don't way to say that. That's the way to say <laughs> it. Just, there are. You know what I mean, though, right? Yeah. I mean, I've seen advertisements for that. Oh, yeah. is it is it related? There's, a, there's one supplement called Ball Refill. Volumizer. Doug, why don't you Google that real quick for us? Like <laughs> Ball Refill. Increase your load. <laughs> no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See what you get. There's another <laughs> yeah. one called uh, Ejaculoid. That's another one that I, I swear to God, these are real supplements. Yeah. No, no affiliation. Sal's already done the research. Right? I, I have. Yeah. No, hey, no, we're not so making any commission rabbit rabbit off these products. You know, to advertise now, them. do you know if there, are there certain natural things that you could do or food? That I you did could not eat? get there yet. So okay. now I'm looking at That's the follow up. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna look up that kind of stuff and see what what natural <laughs> things you can. Sorry, I got excited there. Yeah. Uh, what you can do, but really interesting. And then I thought to myself, like, okay, evolutionarily speaking, why would women multi have multiple orgasms, or more importantly, why do why did the the human male evolve to not be able to? have multiple orgasms. And then it made perfect sense to me. If you think about it, mm. we would not be we, here. We'd be lazy. <laughs> we would yeah. Be <laughs> we'd be fine. Yeah. Like, yeah. We got to get on, keep moving you on. Imagine Try, when you're, go kill yeah, stuff. Yeah. And you're a teenager and you first discover how to, you know, oh, geez, cry. Like, <laughs> go to school. Man, no. This is way better. Remember, stay hey, here. You know what I thought about? Remember that clip on uh, Indiana Jones where the guy's face like, oh, <laughs> That's what I'm so happened. drained right now. Yeah. <laughs> Drink some water, oh. Justin. Oh my god! Oh. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway, speaking of disasters, how? I don't know how to get out of this, but um, <laughs> I showed you guys that video yesterday, dude. Please okay. tell me what the hell, bro. I mean, that is scary. We got a thread, so the audience. So yeah. we have a thread we're all on, right? And we're chatting back and forth, half business, half personal stuff. 
and Justin sends over a video that Courtney obviously sent to him. Look at this. The sun is shining so brightly and reflecting off the table that it is literally about to start a fire on our fucking chair. Holy shit. Can you believe that? And you had a chair in your house. Almost your spontaneously yes. your, combust. Yeah, yes. your dining table all of a sudden was smoking and catch on fire. It was the craziest thing in- It was a uh, demon. Well, that's the thing. Like, okay, so when I bought the place, um, I guess three years previous to that, so it was like rebuilt. So it's only three years old. Um, and, uh, before that, I guess the, the hot tub had caught on fire spontaneously and the whole house went up in flames. Wait a minute. Hold what? A let's, let's stop yeah. for, let's pause. You bought, <laughs> I a, need an you, bought a, you bought a haunted house. I, no, it's not hot. I don't feel like it is. And I'm pretty sensitive to those things. Whoa. Um, and, um, <laughs> you know, the, it's, you're sensitive to spirits. I'm sense. I'm a sensitive spirit guy. <laughs> I am. I told you guys, let me go story. Big it's, dream catcher. It's guy. all legit. <laughs> yeah. But so I, she sends me this video and I'm like, oh my God, it, it, it shows that, um, basically what happened, I think was that like through the window, it, the sun came down and reflected off of part of the metal, um, that was near the table that then re reflected again and intensified the light. And then so create like a magnified, it was like a magnified effect and, and literally like started penetrating the wood, um, leg. And you can even see there's oh, no, a little see, hole. I mean, Andrew will post the video cause you sent the video over. So yeah, it starts post smoking it. and then there, there's still like a little bit of a hole right there. Um, so this is so like wait, when, you, wait, yeah, what's the metal? What is it? What, so this is like. Remember when when you were a kid? Did you ever get? A oh yeah, 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 like ants, ants and spiders, yeah, you light and ants on fire, stuff like that. Yeah, but that's thing. a magnifying glass that you're intentionally holding. Like so, this, this is must like, have created that effect. It must have. Yeah. It must have angled all the sun. What rays kind of metal is this, and what's it doing? Near, <laughs> what, what, like where is it's it? Just, it just. I mean, it, it literally is just almost like is uh, it on it's the, like cr like chrome. It's like it's it's shiny kind of metal. So obviously on the table, where where is it at in your house? Yeah, it's on it. So. The um okay, so the the actual chair itself has wooden legs. Okay. The table itself is the one that has the metal um reflective type. It must be a curve. There must be a slight legs. curve to it, to the metal. Yeah. That's oh. the thing. It must have a curve and then it, it, it must yeah. have bent the light so it like yep. intensified it. Yep. But it just made me it blew my mind because like if Dude, she if didn't you, see that, if you seriously would have gone up in flames. Yeah, if you were not home. Yeah, that is why. Because the way she said she found it, well, was the video she smelt it first. The video yeah. showed smoke coming out of the lake. Oh yeah, no, it was it was literally. It looked like if this stayed going for another half hour, it's catching on hey, fire. How, hey, how funny! How funny out. if you're just you, you're there eating lunch, you just sit there, you even know it's on your leg. Mm -hmm. well, so what did, what did hot, you do? Babe. I mean, are you obviously you guys could get some blinds or something up in that? In yeah, that we room. got it. We do have blinds. Um, I think that we just need to <laughs> use them uh, in the middle of the day now uh, for that specific reason. But yeah, I was like, man, this. This is super dangerous, and yeah. I, I can only imagine people like that have had spontaneous. That's had to happen before. Just, yeah, I mean that's crazy to me. That is, why I would never would even considered that as a as a possibility. Have you ever, Justin? You probably have seen this before. Have you ever read about the the myths and theories on uh, some of the weapons that the Greeks used or the Persians used? Oh yeah, that we don't have. Uh, we don't know how they did it, but they wrote about some of these these methods. They had they like used. big, I don't know if it's bronze mirrors. Uh, yeah, that they used to to try and capture That's the what sun we think. and then and then shoot on like uh, ships yes. that were coming into port. That's what we I think. remember seeing. So yeah, they were they, they would write about. What? There was one thing first off called Greek fire. This was one thing, oh, and yeah. we don't know what the formula was, but apparently they would crush in naval battles because they would spray. It was like napalm. Napalm, yeah. They would spray this, we don't so know what they medieval made it with. Medieval napalm, basically. And they'd light it on fire, spray it, and it would stick to anything and stay on fire, and you couldn't put it out with wire, water. Like, if it hit the water, the water would be on fire, like oil what? or Almost like a grease uh, fire or something. Yes, where, yeah, and they would spray it. They would spray boats with it and couldn't put it out, and it was just, there you go. Archimedes uh, set Roman ships afire with can't see it's and we don't know how they did it. Well, there's it shows. Yeah, it that's reflecting. It. Oh, that's, that's, that's different. The mirror yeah, that's that the mirror we're talking about. That's something different. The other thing that that we think they did is use a giant magnifying glass of some sort to magnify the sun's rays to set uh, ships on fire. So this was like a an actual yeah. uh, you know naval weapon, dude, which is kind of crazy. So yeah. crazy, and of course it's funny because uh, back to the the whole video that Courtney sent. 
um, my kids were trying to describe to me like with intensity what happened, and all they wanted to talk to me about is that she swore a couple times in the oh, video. <laughs> <laughs> she did because yeah, they they what count the on their hands like how many times they've heard us swear, and like so that was you know she just got a couple dings on her on oh, her yeah. mark. My kids hear me swear, <laughs> yeah. oh, but that was time. justified. I'm like the whole house could have just burst into flames when we're not there. Yeah, yeah. that's crazy. No. Yeah. I, I don't think I've seen anything like that before. I didn't even think that that could be possible. So it's so wild. rare because you have to have the right angle of the sun, the right glass, the right reflective surface to create a point Right. And then have something at the right place to, for that point because, that could, that could like you said, the curvature fire. and everything, the, yeah. the actual geometry of that has to all line yeah, up. Yeah, because if the chair was a little further or closer, it wouldn't have hit that point where the sun's rays. Would Although have it would, so it was you like guys a perfect have wood floor, so it would have probably burnt a hole in the wood floor. Though, yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I mean the whole thing, like, and in, in, in who knows with what kind of um, like uh, a finish was on the chair and everything if it would have caught even, you know, right, more intensively because so, of that. Finish. So the house caught spontaneously caught on fire before you oh bought yeah it? before it bought yeah did so, anybody die is this the same way well, I, this mean, is, I was actually excited about it because i'm like this is a brand new house you know basically it's like three years old because the one before that but uh, i guess yeah I, I think it was electrical but you know they they didn't really explain exactly how it happened but it was from the um jacuzzi. hot tub and jacuzzi that was outside like my son's room now um but we we don't have a hot tub now and I'm not going to put it there just because of jinxing, you know, whatever. <laughs> I just, I don't want to mess with it. I'll, you know, I was thinking about getting a hot tub, but way later. Uh, but yeah, so that happened. And wow. The whole thing just, you know, went up. Dude, a, you want to hear something flames. crazy? So my, uh, my uncle, this was a long time ago. So my family works, most of my family works in construction stuff in Sicily or here. And I had an uncle that worked in construction and they, there were some buildings that were put up in the early 1900s that were supposed to be up for a long time, but something happened and they were going to get torn down. So they go to tear down these buildings and they find bodies in the walls. Oh my God. And they think that they were put there by the local mafia chieftains. Wow. So this is where like they take people, kill them, yeah. put them in the wall of a building, build the building. It's not, the building's not going down for, you know, 150 years where they'll, find the, they'll never find the body. There's a book. Dude. There's a book I read a long time ago that talked about this. It's called, uh, Painted walls, yeah, I have it at my. I, <laughs> like, like Justin's book, painted toilet. No, my buddy. So my buddy made me <laughs> read it because his, uh, it's like a, a distant a relative of him toilets. is in the book, and he's like, you got to read this mafia book. It's really interesting. And my my great uncle or something like that is tied or connected to all this, and they actually talked about it. In it. I'll look. I'll look it up and I'll give it to Andrew. Uh, I sent it over so Dude, I can. Speaking of crazy books, you know, before we started the show, we were talking about the Federal Reserve and uh, you know money creation and all this other stuff. Have you ever read The Creature from Jekyll Island? Oh, yeah. No. Oh, bro. that's what, dude. Okay, so that's it's, and it's a true story. Yeah, that's that, what's that crazy. book is what got me all down my rabbit's hole of of you know <laughs> Wait, inconsistent things. <laughs> Your rabbit's hole. <laughs> <laughs> Dang, that's not even worse. Yeah, <laughs> I know that Ron Paul, Ron Paul's book uh, <laughs> and the Fed. Yeah, and the Fed talks about it. So that's I have read about it, but I haven't read that actual book. But he talks about it in that book. It's so it's so weird to consider that the Federal Reserve is 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 not a federal agency like yeah. Federal Express. It's a bank. Which a gangster. It's a bank that we literally said, Banksters. legally, you're the only bank that can make our currency. No other bank can compete with you. And you will make the currency, give it to the U.S. government, and we'll have to pay it back with interest. So the government, our government doesn't even make its own money. Yeah. We, we issued a bank to do that. They give us interest rate. We pay it back with interest, and no one else can. It's a, it, yeah. If you read The Creature from Jekyll Island... It will blow you the the way that that all got t put oh, together. It's, it just made me so angry, so uh, wild. Yeah, wasn't it like a gangster meeting behind closed doors? Bro, and a handful of people that were making that decision. Oh, oh yeah, dude. Yeah. And politicians were greased, and how, this is how we do it. And you guys want to know the last? Here we go. Ready? You want to know the last president to talk about the go our U.S. government minting its own coins, not from the Federal Reserve? You want to know the last person to do that? Explain what that would mean, minting our own coins. That means the Federal Reserve doesn't make this. The U.S. government will make its own coin. So there is mm. no interest on it. There is no whatever. It is not a note. It's our money. And it was going to be made with silver. It was a silver coin. And it mm. was it, there was the last U.S. president to, to talk about trying to do this. Let me guess, was he assassinated? It was JFK. Yeah. Oh, wow. To JFK go. before he got assassinated. <laughs> wow. There you yeah, go. Wow. We need the X Files music, Andrew. Is that this? Is that what they mean by NFTs that are minted? Then remember, we just talking to. Oh, minted just means it's yeah, it's made. 
Oh, that's yeah, all? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, okay. I yeah. thought it was all on the same no, lines. No, 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 mm. no. All right, I got some more cool studies for you. You guys Sweet. ready? Yeah, okay. lay it on me. Magnesium threonate. So this is a form of magnesium uh, that was created by scientists at MIT. It's the only form of magnesium that could cross the blood-brain barrier mm. and has been shown to improve cognition, reduce uh, inflammation, improve brain plasticity. So in other words, your ability to learn new tasks and new things. And it increases BDNF, brain-derived neurotropic factor. So it's just like interesting form of magnesium that's got all these cognitive boosting, relaxing effects uh, in the body. So a lot of these other magnesium products don't are, are aren't as effective as passing Bro. through that uh, membrane. They don't that separates no. The brain, so right? like a lot of magnesium supplements are like magnesium, I think citrate or whatever. So you put in your water, it fizzes, and you drink it. And then you get well, the poops afterwards. Yeah, I was going to say, one of the biggest um, questions I get all the time if I'm like talking about magnesium and supplementing with it is like, well, you know, doesn't that make you shit right away? Yep. Yeah. Yep. Those kinds, those forms will. Yeah. Three and eight, not, not so much. And so, so three and eight is what's in mellow, right? That makes mellow so That's one effective. of the main forms of magnesium. That's, so that's what, what it, you feel. So why, why is it, uh, I, I doubt, you know, uh, Ned is the only people that know this. So why is it that most uh, other magnesium products don't use this? Is it extremely cheap in comparison? It's or more expensive. The, the three and eight. Yeah, is, more But expensive. not the regular magnesium. No, no, regular magnesium is cheap as hell. Uh, yeah, okay. it's very inexpensive. And some people like the laxative effect. I, I, I mean, it's actually a quite safe laxative if you need I guess if that's what you need, right? Yeah, that would make sense. Yeah. But, but it's not promoted not that majority, way most yeah. of the time, right? Is that, is that how no, it's... No, but I mean, yeah. you know, people, they, 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 they promote it to calm you. Because magnesium uh, deficiency or is, is quite common, especially in stressed uh, individuals or athletes. Mm. And if you're able to supplement with an absorbable form of magnesium, what you notice is you're just less anxiety, more calm, better recovery, better muscle contractions, like a lot of good effects, but it needs to be uh, absorbed. Yeah, so um, in mellow, one of the main, fo one, of the, one of the forms of magnesium they put in there is the, the, the three and eight. But they also have, I think, GABA and maybe Doug, go to the ingredients if, if you're on there right now. I think this is one of those uh, <clears throat> supplements or one of those ingredients you don't really consider that you're deficient in uh, yeah. until you actually start taking it and you're like, oh my God, yeah. it actually makes a massive difference. It's also got theanine in there, which is the amino acid that I always talk about where you, you actually feel chill. Doug, what's it. the what's the R next to the the magatine or whatever? What is that? Yeah, that's a registered well, that's, trademark. That's the brand name of magnesium three and eight. So magnesium three and eight is a synthetic form and patented form of magnesium. It's a patented form of magnesium. So mm. it's not one that you find in nature. It's a uh. form of magnesium that's uh, that they modified to cross, and it readily crosses the blood-brain barrier. So when you take it, you notice it. You actually feel it. You actually feel the the chill, calm, oh, like, interesting kind of cognitive boosting effects. Have you noticed you dream better? Dude, I... It's been a, one of the supplements that, and I, again, and here's the thing. It's like, if you're somebody who tries it and you feel minimal effects with it, you're probably not deficient. I recognize that I'm obviously deficient because it was like that dramatic for me. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's a, I, I have set up, I don't know if you guys have ever seen in my room, but I, like I have like, I keep two boxes that are always there. I have all these little yep. mini water bottles. You took I, it with you when we went to yeah, uh, no, I, Arizona. It's It makes that big of a difference on my sleep and I mm -hmm. sleep so deep, so long. I fall asleep right away. Like it has made a huge difference. And I've tried magnesium before. Like I, rem I remember as an early trainer, uh, it being touted as this great sleep supplement and taking it and being like, oh, I don't really notice a difference mm -hmm. or whatever. And so I never really bought into it and didn't buy it. I didn't mess with it. And the only reason why I did is because obviously it's a company we work with. They say, here's our new product mm -hmm. and we try everything. Mm -hmm. And I just, and I remember the first time I thought, oh, that's just got to be, you know, there has to be lucky. I'm just random. Or maybe I just got a good night's sleep and second time, third time. And it's like consistently it makes that big of a difference. Yeah, no, I'll take it before I watch a movie at night. Mm -hmm. I'll actually bring, drink it first, and about 30 minutes into the movie, I feel like I'm just like, because uh, you guys know me, I, I'm, um, I don't know, what's a, for lack of a better term, twitchy. Like, you know, when I sit or sit. <laughs> yeah. yeah, fidgety. Fidgety, yeah, very yeah, fidgety. Yeah. Wow, right. now supplements uh, patented it. It's no, not no, no, now, no, no, it's no, a company no, no. called Megceuticals. No, oh, so no, they, no, no, oh, oh. They're they using, patented it. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. So it's a, it's a patented form of uh. Of, so mag magnesium three. So they use it also. They're not. They're not. There's a lot of companies that have access to uh, magnesium. magnesium 
Three, three and eight, which is the mega. So that means yeah. whoever whoever created this, ha- you have is to get from royalty, ha- yeah, exactly. is making royalties on Correct. all these people that are wow. Correct. Yes. But now what? What? what Go down that rabbit hole. Find yeah, out who that gotta, is. It, I want to know yeah. how much money they're it's making. That's right, right there. It, it, it it makes I want to know how much they're making. Okay. Well, I get I'll find you, out. I, for you found out who they are. Like now, yeah. tell me how much if they if they have the patent on this and it's that amazing and all these companies are now using it. I can't imagine how wealthy that is. Yeah. That person. So, but remember, Mello has GABA and L-theanine in it as well. So it's got the combination. It's got other things in there that contribute to that kind of relaxing. Children. Well, and I've always, I mean, ever since you've introduced me to theanine, I've already, I've loved theanine. Yeah. So the, the combination of theanine then with the fact that I was probably deficient in magnesium is probably what makes mm. this perfect storm of an amazing. Wow. That's not that much, Doug, but no. how old is that? Six million is their revenue. Yeah. That's, that's, that's not it? that much. Mm. Shocking. That's not, but hold on a second. I want, but not that, not that it even makes a big, cause that's not a lot of money to begin with for oh, Hay- thinking. Hayward, California, but I wonder what the margins are on that. Cause magnesium's cheap. Yeah, and 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 maybe making this version is really cheap, so maybe their margins are massive. Hmm. You know, very it's, possible. Yeah, and it, but it was it was literally a, a group of scientists from MIT that put this together and created. Oh, really? It. Yeah, okay. I don't know when was it invented, Doug. Maybe we can find out. Well, right there's Hayward, right? Can you click on that and see when the patent was created? <laughs> okay, let yeah. me look here. Let's yeah. see. Let's send see Doug down the road. Anyway, while he's doing that, uh, I'm going to talk about another one of our partners. So Felix Ray keeps winning awards. I don't know if you guys saw this. For mm. blue light blocking glasses. Yeah, so CNET did something. There was another. I, I read an article, and they're ranking like the best blue light blocking glasses. And every single so far, every single ranking I've seen, Felix Ray is there. That's nice. one of the best ones. I'm glad you brought them up because I I want to because I want to make uh, or let people know uh, that they have a a place on there where you can look at what uh, type of face you have. Narrow, mm. round, fat, Chubby. little. Yeah. And I know this, I talk about- This is important. Yeah, yeah, it is important because we we bought Felix Gray glasses, or Katrina did for our nephew- and he's got a he's got a he's got a Justin noggin. You oh, know yeah. what I'm saying he's got like a big head. By the way, and if you look at Justin's it's a hat, cranium. Right now, yeah. If you look at his hat, you can see where he's got the you know the, the snap on or whatever. Yeah. There's it's like hanging by a thread. It's, oh yeah, it's about to just bust. Yeah. Right if now. I put yeah. if I yeah. put his hat on right now, you yeah, won't be able to see. Like It'll a, cover my. Head. I always say it would look like a bucket on, on me. So <laughs> even though I got a fat face. I have a little head. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I like you have a little. A I, have a little I have a little pin head with a big fat you have a face. Pair, it's like a pear face. <laughs> yeah. So, and I tell people all the time, I tell people all the time that I love the Nash glasses, but it's because I do. I actually have a narrow a narrow face, so the Nash fits yeah. me really well. I messed up because I remember you talking about Nash, and I bought some, and it does not fit me. No, it is not for big heads. And my nephew has a big head like Justin. These are, so, are the big the big boys. What? These are the Jemisons. Yes. Yeah. And that's why I told her we had to refund so, and or, or change them out. And yeah. get the other ones oh because goodness. those fit. Yes. It's, it's, it's just yeah. immediate, and those look know. like the that big, so uh, big old glasses Clark on my Kent. face. So yeah, but they have it on the site, so you could actually go and it'll say like uh, they have like a medium, medium wide, really wide, like what what yeah. your shape of your face is. So you should look at that before you know. Just because we one of us says that we like a style, you got to kind of know if you have a, a smaller head, a bigger head, it makes a difference. Yeah. So you and I have a similar shaped. Head, you just have fatter face than I do. Yeah, yeah, and you have a beak nose, you know. Yeah. So we have this kind of different. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, <laughs> so. It's made for peck, peck, peck. <laughs> <laughs> I guess, yeah, real fast, but very similar. Uh, very yeah, yeah. similar. Hey, we're, speaking we're of you, similar. Did you, so I was watching Cobra Kai last night. Did oh, you see my story? Oh, dude. Yeah, I did. This dude I, is wearing the exact so same addictive. shoes as Johnny Lawrence. Oh, oh, yeah. not, not saw, today though. Not did, today. did you see uh, his son was wearing that like Vans jacket that I have too? Yeah, yeah. Oh, Green one? Yeah, the green one. Yeah, I was yeah. like, oh, that's my jacket. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So we're super cool. Apparently. I guess. Yeah. We're, well, the, yeah. His son's kind of cool. I don't know if Johnny Lawrence Hold is on really a second. that cool. Who's your favorite character on the show? <laughs> <laughs> Who's your favorite character on the show? That's fair. That's All fair. Right, All right, yeah, Didn't fair. he drive an IROC Johnny's at one point? Johnny's the man, yeah. dude. That's a cool yeah, car, yeah, let me yeah, tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Bro, I, they, they, I just got to the episode where... Uh, they are training to fight each other. Have you seen that one yet? No, yes. I, I, you got to watch it. Because bro, it's so I can't. Funny, it's a Rocky I've been trying montage. To watch it, but yeah. my wife sits down and wants to watch something, and then they, we can never pick what to watch because we never agreed. So, uh, so frustrating. Yeah. <laughs> I, what are, okay, story. I know you guys both are kind of like that, right? Where the wives don't like to say what. What shows do you, your wife, and you guys agree the on? The only thing documentaries that, are uh, yours. Documentaries and stand-up comedy. That's that's the go-to for the two of us. She's cool with like fantasy and like stuff like that. As long as there's like good looking dudes. Oh, well, okay. You know, like The Witcher. Like, come on, ladies. The Witcher. I know what you're doing. Like, That's funny because that is the only thing that Katrina doesn't like that I would would watch. I've been wanting you like to watch. watching handsome guys too, or what? No, I've what been wanting about? to watch The Witcher, but if it's kind of 
fantasy, sci-fi, and the other what was it? Foundations, the other one. Oh yeah, those are the only. Those are the only great. ones. Sci-fi. I love sci-fi and fantasy. Sci-fi and fantasy is the only thing that Katrina and I don't. Re- mm. Other than that, like I mean, I, I watched ESPN Man and Arena. Uh, binge that last night with mm. Katrina, and she loves that. Like I could watch sports no, stuff no, all this, day. This is, well, this, she'll watch Dexter with me and all that kind of stuff because she loves murder. Like that's right. Anything I murder. Courtney's all into that stuff. Like yeah, she's in. Uh, you guys do any role play with that, or I, I haven't. <laughs> you know what? I should just like surprise her one day. <laughs> just come in with like an axe. So, how do you guys do it if there's a show like, um, you know, how do you watch something that you really want to watch if they're like not on the same page as far as you have like a special? Well, time I mean, technically, or, I can watch. You know, I control the remote. You know what I mean? Yeah. Oh, is that right? Yeah, you control. So it's just, it's I don't believe the only that. thing. I you can you control the remote, but you don't control the music you work out to. I don't believe. No, that. No, 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 no. That's that's because I'm listen. I'm so, a so I'm a merciful. <laughs> I'm a merciful husband, so I give in sometimes. No, it's uh, no. All joking aside, it's so. Here's here's what's really funny. Jessica will be like, "Oh, I think there's a movie. Maybe we'll both like." And yeah. she'll give me the name. Yeah. And I've already caught on. I'll be like, "Is Ryan Reynolds in it?" Um. Well, yeah, but that's not why. Anyway, honey, I'm pretty sure that's why yeah. you picked this movie. You <laughs> See? know? Yeah, it goes both ways. That's why I want to watch Wonder Woman. You know what you're gonna do? Stop it. See now you just ruined me. Who's that? Who has be, who has better taste out of the out of the two of you guys with your with your wives? Who has a better taste to pick? Like if you guys if you since you guys have different well, tastes and me. one of you goes, hey, let's watch this. The wife says, I want to watch this movie, or you say, let's watch this. Who's normally right in that situation? Oh, who's right? Mm. Yeah. Oh, that's me, hundred <laughs> percent. Really? Yeah. Well, uh, I actually absolutely. decide all of it, and then I have to like come up with something else if she doesn't like it so it's just like all the pressure's on me all the time you know <laughs> make me happy justin yeah, no exactly <laughs> no you know what jessica will do i'll put no, I'll, you, you you go ahead what, you what, find something oh yeah if i give her the room i'll find you and then she doesn't want to do that doesn't but, want you, yeah. but anything we'll, to do with it we'll be certain what I'll, is that with like could you do that to me last night like threw the remote at me yeah so i was like here you do it they want yeah. you to drive i'm like i want to watch cobra i guess you're right it's the same thing yeah as we're as i'll go through and we're oh we can't find something now it's 30 minutes of searching and then finally i'll be like you know what if we just watch this like this looks she'll be like fine i'll just be on my phone and i'm like oh, all right yeah. <laughs> so half the time i'll be like okay <laughs> sounds good to me yeah but we do, we do right. find uh, we often do find like good stand-up or good uh documentary what documentary we watched See, one he doesn't like stand- i love stand-up and she's just like oh oh really yeah, she's just like over it she I has guess. such a I, sense of humor i would think that she would enjoy that she she does but like um she I gets guess enough I stand-up it, at home with you him, know like you know? i just i could watch it all day like i just pick apart i just love i don't know i love like people's different takes on things you know like i guess her. katrina is not a big she'll watch it with me but she's she wouldn't go to a, a stand-up where i would watch like you mm-hmm. i like i love i watch most of the stand-up that's on netflix just to, mm-hmm. at least give it the first 20 minutes to mm-hmm. see if it's something i really right. like you yeah, know, and then I'll, I'll bail if I. Don't I cannot like it. remember the guy's name. I'm so upset now, but I found a guy last night we were watching, and his humor is so dark. I was, I love it. He yeah. like every, Netflix or something. Else, uh, he was on Netflix. Okay, he's so part of Legion of Skanks. Those guys are hilarious. No, so okay, so there's this like series on Netflix uh, where they're showing like multiple. There's like four seasons, and there's multiple um, stand-up comedians. Mm-hmm. So you could watch like 30 oh, minutes of each one. Yeah. And one of them on there, this dude was so dark. Like, he'll make jokes about some of the most taboo subjects, which I love. I love that, especially if you do a good job. Yeah. Because you, you laugh because you're like, I can't believe he just I'll said that. I'll have to watch that. I know Mark Norman was on that. He's really funny. Is that his name? I don't know. I but just found the guy you that- might, Oh, no, it is that. I think that Mark is him. Mark Norman? Yes. Yeah, he's great. Bro, he's dark. He's really funny. Oh, yeah. Oh, Super dark. dark. Yeah. What was he? What one was he on? Pull that up, Doug. Mark Norman. The I don't know if I've even seen that sir. one. Stand-ups? Have you seen that, Doug? It's, I haven't. You're Netflix. normally on top of all those too. Yeah, I like to watch stand up, but most of the time I only get through about ten minutes. Of no, it. you and I are a lot alike with the comedians that we like. I've, we've taken recommendations from these guys before, and I know <laughs> you, you and I both have bailed. Yeah, I can. Or, I can. You don't I have can a wide sit through it because I like. I appreciate. Like, yes, me too. Them writing their way. Th- I'm like, okay, their thought process into it, but sometimes they don't land. But it's like I try and still give them a chance. Yeah. I really like the guy that um, Rogan recommended just recently. That uh, the black guy that was on that that one series that had like four comedians. Oh, rotating. I know what you're about. Uh, he who was good. He said, yeah. he, I, 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 I didn't even know Rogan recommended him. I found him and then I just happened to be on Rogan's page, like, I don't know, a few days later. And I saw that, like, a couple weeks prior, he had talked about him being like this up and coming mm-hmm. comic. Have really you guys? Liked. So I was on a podcast recently, can't remember the name of it, um, but. It was it was hosted by a comedian. Oh, this is the one I'm talking about right here, the stand-ups. Yes, that's what I'm yeah. saying. So yeah, this guy, Mark yeah. Norman, was uh, on the latest so season. So this the black guy I'm talking about Kate, was on this one that Joe Rogan recommended. Yes, if you go to season four, Doug, then we'll be able to see both because he was on the same season who okay. you're talking about. I know exactly. I just don't remember his name. Yeah, There's only three seasons. 
or third season. It's the last season. He's kind of a heavy set dude. Yeah, right, bigger dude. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 We'll we'll find him. We'll find him as soon as Doug goes to the, uh, you know. Yeah, season. I don't know if I wa- I don't think I watched the whole thing. I caught him and I really liked him. I thought, oh, he's because I think the next one was a girl and I. So I, I, I got like interviewed. What's his really name much. again? Uh, Mark, Mark Norman. Norman. Mark Norman. Yeah, here he is. Yeah. So let me see. Oh, I want to see what it looks like. No, no, this is him. Oh, oh. Norm. Okay, this guy is. I'm pretty sure this is him. His humor he's, he's is super dry, too. dry and it. dark. Yeah. Like he'll joke about shit that you're like, really? Did he just say that? Yeah. So I was, I got interviewed. I remember the guy's name by a comedian, and that's him right there. And uh, oh, I haven't seen him. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He's good. And okay. we were, you know, we were talking, and then I brought up the com- the the topic of comedy, and I said, for a second there, it seemed like comedians were afraid. Yeah. To say certain jokes, they and were. now it Just seems like four years ago. Yes, and yeah. I said, and now it seems like the pendulum has swung the other direction. And he goes, "You're totally right." He goes, "Dave Chappelle came out, well, yeah. and blasted it, yeah. and now kind of gave everybody Dave, like the okay, you know, yeah, that's what now, it was." And now yeah. humor, the comedians are going dark and touching mm-hmm. everything again, which I'm happy. I'm happy that that Thank happens. Because yeah. if you don't like it, turn it off. You know what I mean? But you should be able to say what the well, fuck you just, want. Well, it's just, yeah, like challenge challenge everybody's ideas. Like that needs to happen always. Mm-hmm. And that's what I love about comedy. It takes the air out of it, but it also challenges your ideas so you think about things a little bit differently. Totally. I yeah. always enjoy when you talk, like I didn't know that, like the history of it, right? Going all the way back to jesters and what they were there for in the first place. Yeah. Which, I mean, that's kind of what the role is, right? Is to kind of, <laughs> Uh, make fun of the the norm. You know? Well, it's uh, humor. You're you uh, originally it's you're be able to say things that you couldn't normally say because it's in the context of humor, and when that stops, that's they the what they used to say was that's when you know the king is is ter- is going to go tyrannical. It's tyrannical yeah. is when he kills his gesture for making a bad joke or whatever. Now you're afraid. Because now you can't even joke about what's comedy like things. in other countries, Doug. Do you know? <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Well, I mean, that's the only one I thought. Well, stand ups originated here <clears throat> in in the U.S. Did I it? Believe. Yeah, um, cool. and I think that, I mean I think it's obviously it's spanned across the world now, but like it wasn't a thing. It was like more vaudeville and kind of like. Well, a, so I don't know if you guys knew yeah, that. What's it like in like communist shows? countries like China? Like you never hear about like stand up comedians that are that are big in, in China. China. Oh, yeah. I'm sure. Though. I wonder. Well, that's what you're making me think like that. I wonder if they like. Hey, China's the greatest, you know. Ha, ha, ha. Everybody laughs. <laughs> well, I think I think there are different senses of humor though. Yeah. I remember going to movies in Japan and they're usually in English with Japanese subtitles. Mm-hmm. And so I'd be laughing away at stuff and nobody be laughing in the mm. theater except me. You know, I like, I like, <laughs> That's awkward. I like, uh, that was me when I watched Borat with my brother and we were there and like, uh, they, they had this whole scene where they're naked and they're running and, all, and we're just dying and nobody was laughing. What kind of humor is that? Like okay, Borat, uh, Napoleon Dynamite, um, there's certain, uh, Zoolander, there's certain, uh, shows that I didn't like the first time I watched it, and then fell in love with it two, three, four times later. Yeah, is that a t- what is that? I don't know. And what uh, causes that? Have you guys experienced that before? Yeah, where uh-huh. there's a show you watch the Especially first time in movies? Yeah, like Napoleon Dynamite was totally like, like what well, the fuck Zoolander, am I watching? I remember watching Napoleon going, Dynamite's funnier the more you watch it. Yes, the, the tenth it, time the, you watch it, it's funnier. Than it's that. how I feel about I that. Think a lot of Ben Zoolander. Stiller movies are like that. Yeah, yeah. 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 that's how Zoolander. Zoolander is yeah. one of my favorite movies, and I hated it the first time. You know I what? I Tropic, love? Tropic Thunder. <laughs> although I yeah. laughed immediately. Tropic Thunder. I saw it, but it's funnier the more you watch it. You know what's one of my favorite? Like when you talk to people and the sense of humor that people have. Have the 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 United Kingdom's cultural sense of humor yeah, yeah. is my favorite. Yeah, yeah. They they because they're, they're silly. Well, they're just fucking offensive yeah. and uh and like openly and it's funny and nobody they don't get offended so easily and it's great. I love well, it. That's why we got to connect with uh, James Smith. Yeah. Shout out to him. That's why I, lo- I love his his fitness content that he puts out. Mm-hmm. Dude, Monty Python and Holy Grail wrong. still stands up. Yeah. Like my but, kids think it's funny. But now here's what's interesting. A lot of people don't know this. So obviously there's a lot of the western nations you would consider free, so European countries, you know, Australia, US, whatever. But there are two unique freedoms that Americans have that are protected way more than others. One is the Second Amendment. We don't need to talk about that. That one's kind of obvious. Second one's a f- speech. Mm-hmm. No other country has protected speech like America. Like, for example... Yeah, you think Canada was like that, and it's not even No, close. no, yeah. no, no. Like in, like in Germany, there's laws against uh, things you can say against Jews or things you can say that are pro-Nazi or whatever, right? Uh, and, and I know there was a, a comedian in the UK who got fined because he made his dog 
do the uh, Hitler the, thing. the Hail Hitler yeah. <laughs> thing, oh, which which is just which is so ridiculous. That you're gonna get fined for that. It, it's stupid, but why are you gonna? But my point is, in America, that's one uh, protection that we have that is really unique. Like speech is protected here, pretty much across the board, unless you're inciting violence and they have to make a case for that. Yeah, which is kind of interesting. Uh, so although, it makes sense. Although that woke culture is trying to fight against, they're that. trying hard, yeah. but it is such a. And you know what's what I love about it is that it's it's explicitly protected in our constitution but it's also the one freedom that Americans have always generally supported Americans have always generally supported the other ones have been in, in flux mm -hmm. uh, but speech for the most part Americans I feel like free like, speech and free markets is one of the main reasons why most people want to migrate here those uh, two things I would think are one of the are two of the biggest draws. Prosperity, yeah, right. draws here is that you but have, speech our is, markets are so free compared to a lot of places People don't know this free but free speech but speech Popular speech doesn't need to be protected. The protecting speech literally is protect unpopular speech, which includes shitty speech. Yeah, but also includes speech that might be unpopular today. But also, you but can ridicule shitty speech, right? Yeah. So yeah. that's that's the whole thing. Is it, it should be able to be there, but you can stuff it by you know mocking it at the Mo same time. Yeah, mocking it or debating it. Yeah. Right. Hey, check this out. Uh, do you like soda? Of course you do. They're delicious. Here's the problem: they're packed full of sugar. They're bad for you. They make your teeth look bad. Make you gain body fat. Well, that's not what happens when you drink Olipop. Olipop tastes like the sodas you grew up drinking, except very, very low in calories, no sugar, and they contain compounds that are good for gut health. It's actually a gut health drink. It's incredible, and it tastes good. They have flavors like root beer and vintage cola, strawberry, vanilla, orange squeeze, and much more good stuff and good for you. Go check them out. Head over to mindpumppartners.com. Find Olipop, click on it, and then use the code MINDPUMP for a big discount. All right, here comes the rest of the show. First question is from Donaldson Spencer. What are your thoughts on Mark Ripito and the starting strength method? Oh, love it. Let's let's talk first about starting strength. Yeah, starting program. strength's great. It's one of the, I'd say one of the only, one of the few programs that will produce gains in a lot of people and strength. In muscle size, it's a they focus. It's almost entirely focused on compound, mm -hmm. effective lifts. It's a lower volume, somewhat program. You're training the body a few days a week. You're focusing on squats and deadlifts and bench presses. I mean, it's, it's not, super simplistic. It's not that much different than anabolic. I mean, it is. But anabolic includes more accessory work. Yeah, we phase the reps. Yeah, there's it's it's even more simple than anabolic, but very. The, the, okay, the, the you can thing, see that the things in anabolic that give you the greatest bang for your buck are in Ripto yeah. starting strength. Yes, in fact, when I wrote anabolic, um, starting strength was definitely one of the influences. It was one of the programs that actually works. Sure. It actually does work. You know, you have like five by five and starting strength, and then there's principles in bodybuilding that tend to work, and you know, all that kind of was compiled to make maps anabolic. But you know, starting strength, especially if you're getting into resistance training. Now you're not a complete <laughs> beginner but you're kind of getting into it or you want to do something that really just focus on building strength and muscle um, in a consistent you know, fashion, it's a great program. It's free. You go online. You can get it. Now, the I guess there's some downsides, right? The downsides are that it's, it's a bit one-dimensional, yeah. um, so you can develop some imbalances. There's no rotation typically involved. It's pretty much in the sagittal plane. Is that right? all there is to like? So I I know that much about starting strength to know that it, it's similar to anabolic. I've seen kind of the phasing yeah. and the exercises. Does he not have progressions and what he recommends as programs to follow up, or is it like this is the program? They do, but it's really I mean similar. He, he really hammers like squat, deadlift, press, row, and I understand why. Right for most mm. people. That's excellent advice. Well, it's also why almost every one of our programs has those components. Yes. But, <laughs> that's why it's called starting strength. I mean, it's the foundational yeah. like meat and potatoes that you need to focus on. And I think that's why, you know, I think it's super effective. Yeah. Now he can be himself, he can be a little abrasive because he's real hardcore about I it. I like him. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's, he's I, an I old like, dog, dude. I do. I like people. Those like I that. tell you what, those old strength coaches are great. All yeah, of them. Yeah. Like you get someone who's been training people for strength for you know, no 30 bullshit years, type of guy. You're gonna you're gonna hear like who's the why guy haven't that, we hooked up with Ripto? Did did our buddy I Mike Mike do, Matthews did Mike yeah, do Ripto? He him. did. Why he, haven't we linked with him? Have we not reached out? We I should. haven't reached out personally. Yeah, we should. He's pretty controversial all the way across the. That's board. why he'd be fun to talk to. You sure. know what? I love to talk to him about because I know he he shits all over the trap bar. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. So he would be a fun person to kind of have. But he's that. controversial about everything. I know. He like is. he talked about anything. Yeah. And he's like he's very opinionated. Well, I so it's a good time. I yeah. re, so what made me really go down the rabbit hole and stuff. So I kind of knew his stuff before, but when we had Jordan Shallow on the uh, YouTube channel, Shallow threw a shot across the bow at his uh, squat cues. Oh mm-hmm. right. And and he's got a very uh, strong following uh, and loyal following of people, and like we got a bunch of hate. Uh, from that, I'm you know like, why he's got such a strong all? following? Because a lot of kids, shit works. A lot of kids yeah. went and found starting strength. It became really popular early 2000s when you know you know people were finding it on the internet. And um, up until that point, you had all these kids doing body part splits and these crazy routines. And then they're like, "Oh, I'm doing three exercises today. This is going to be crazy. I don't know if this is going to work." And then you got all these reports and like, "Oh my god, I've never been so strong. I'm building all this muscle and." So they've got hardcore followers because that's a good point because the '90s really was the birth of the bodybuilder split kind of or like the really the explosion of that. When yeah. you say that, the '90s was was what got everybody doing these body part splits and intensity training and all this accessory work. Yeah, yeah. And so, what a brilliant thing! Starting strength comes out with something that's totally counterintuitive to what was popular at that time. It's probably what made it blow up. Yeah, and and, and people again were were just so excited about this actually works and it's so simple and I can't believe it and. But again, I'd say that the the weaknesses lie in the fact that you can develop some imbalances. You're not working in a lot of different planes. Um, it doesn't have. It, 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 there's you know one principle in, in starting strength is definitely a true one, which is there are certain lifts you should practice often, get good at them, and they should always pretty much be in your routine. But that doesn't mean there isn't any value to lots of other movements to train the body in different ways to avoid injury to develop and to, to develop balance and you need to do that kind of stuff well as this well. is why maps performance follows exactly this i mean that was the thought process when we wrote performance and when we wrote our programs right it wasn't like oh what's going to sell the most it was no. like okay how are we, we going to train someone yeah we were training somebody we just took them through maps anabolic what are they lacking mm-hmm. so even though we believe that that's one of the best programs it is our most sold program and probably the most valuable for the average person to start there we know that once they're there and they've been following that, we wouldn't want them to stay there forever. Mm-hmm. We'd have to move them into something else. What would that look like? It would look like maps performance. Yeah. Yeah, and one thing, the the main things that people will say about starting strength is that, especially their squat, will go through the roof. So there's a lot of jokes about starting strength people that they got like big butts and quads and everything else, mm-hmm. which is pretty cool. But it's uh, again, it's a it's a solid routine. I mean, I'll call it out if if I need to, and I'll be honest and say something's great if it is. Mm-hmm. We have no affiliation. We don't make any money off the program or anything like that. It's a solid routine. It's based in solid principles. And for a lot of people, um, it definitely will work and make you stronger. It is not the be-all, end-all, unfortunately, especially if you have a long-term approach to your mm-hmm. fitness. Nor is any one of our programs. Correct. I, I, we stand by that, too. I would never tell anybody that, oh, MAPS Anabolic is the end-all, be-all program. Stick no. with it forever. So. No, no. You need to do different things to really maintain your body and to make sure you're not um, you know, developing particular imbalances or, or you know, aches and pains and injuries and just develop a kind of a whole – you know, uh, balanced physique type of deal. Well, yeah, your body... Uh, yeah, you're, you're strong in multiple directions. Yeah, your daily movements, you don't always move in the sagittal plane. Mm-hmm. So your your workout should mimic what real life should kind of look like. And yeah. that's where some of those programs yeah. lack. But the cool thing about Ripto is he says stuff like strength is the foundational physical pursuit. Very true. Yep. Yeah. How strength is so important for pretty much any physical pursuit. Very true. Yep. You're weak... Your stamina means nothing. If you're weak, your flexibility means nothing. In fact, yeah. it becomes a, a liability. So he he hits and and he's got a, he has had a tremendous impact in the world of resistance training. And I would put him up there, not as the guy that knows everything. I don't think anybody knows everything. But I would put him up there as one of the you know the godfathers of, of resistance yeah, he, training. He, strength I training. mean, if we were building, that's a, we should do that sometime. Like the the Rushmore of fitness. Yeah, that'd be kind of a cool episode to talk yeah. about. Who Who's we the think founder? Of, Who is the founder? That's what was a good idea. what's that powerlifting club that was breaking record? I can't believe it. I forgot. Uh, Westside Barbell. Yeah. West Who's Side. the founder of that? Uh, I can't think of his name right Doug, now. Maybe I can picture look. him. You know, I can picture yeah. him with his shirt off and his tattoos. He's and, another old dog that's yeah, just yeah. freaking great, right? Yeah. Well, I can't they, think of his name. They had contributed. Uh, he's contributed so much to strength. strength How are strength. all three of us drawing a blank on this? Louis, Louis Simmons. Simmons. Thank you. My Jeez. So embarrassing. Yeah. It's, like, <laughs> it's like not remembering Arnold's name. You know? Yeah. Like yeah. Charles Louis Poliquin was the yeah, character. So, yeah. These are all there. all people that had tremendous influence. Let, write that down. Let's do an episode on that. Let's build. Let's build who we think are like like the Mount Rushmore of strength. Yeah. Yeah. 
yeah, or yeah. just fitness in general. And we could, who I think are some of the, the pioneers in our space, uh, like have really laid the foundation. Dr. Ed Thomas. I'll I mean, I would even that. argue Paul Check goes in there, dude. I, think, I would, yeah, I would too. I think I some, because especially if when you talk about unconventional type stuff, yeah. like I definitely think that he belongs up there. Next question is from Flunky Com. What's the best way to grow the hamstrings? You know, it's funny about the hamstrings. It's, it's in men, it's one of the body parts that guys think are not that big of a deal. They don't like to place a lot of focus. I'm going to tell you something right now. If you want, first off, women don't like men with underdeveloped legs. It's a joke, but it's true. You want to have balance in your body just from an aesthetic perspective. Forget performance. It's obviously important for performance. But if you want your legs to look incredible, have developed hamstrings. I think that develop it, hamstrings. I think it's so weird to not think that. It's it would be like because no one would ever say, "Hey, I want great arms, but skip triceps." Yeah, or not <laughs> have good. You shoulders. just do biceps, but skip mm -hmm. triceps. I mean, they would just think that's absurd. It's the mm -hmm. same concept. Like if you want to develop yep, great legs, off. Yeah. I I actually think it's it's more so that it's one of the more difficult. Uh, muscles to find a lot of different exercises for. And people, again, think that you need all this variety and, and changing up different, yeah. you know, machines and exercises to do it. And so... Well, most people think the leg curl is the best well, yeah, hamstring exercise. It's the, it's the easiest, most basic thing to do. And then a lot of people don't deadlift. A lot mm -hmm. of people don't do good mornings, you mm -hmm. know, which are great movements and are great for the hamstrings, yeah. but a lot of people don't do them. Yeah. So between that and then the hamstring machine being kind of... And donkey, or the, the donkey kickback or whatever, like the, yeah. the two main machines that you see in gyms i think that has a lot to do yeah with why no, I don't. no hands down uh romanian deadlift uh was in my experience is the best overall hamstring developer it just it works a whole hamstring you can load it significantly you can get really strong romanian involves a knee bend mm -hmm. that's fixed so stiff-legged would so the be knee a, doesn't come forward it just stays it's in yeah place, you bend yeah. the knees but then it's fixed right so that takes some pressure off the lower back and allows you to really load the hamstrings. And if you're good at it, you've got good technique and good stability. Uh, I mean, I've 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 done uh, Romanian deadlifts with four uh, over 400 pounds, mm -hmm. um, and really I can feel and see the development of my hamstrings. The hamstrings are super important for deadlifts, for any version of deadlifts, for squats, and then if you're an athlete, oh my god, it, it's crucial. You have if you have weak hamstrings, yeah. hamstring tears are common. Because yeah. of you know hamstrings that it's are all how, about how you decelerate over mm -hmm. right? overpowered quads too. That's why yeah. you see that in baseball players running to first base. It's like one of the most common injuries yes. because they're they're so strong on the on the anterior on the front side on your quads. Yeah. They overpower, so they're so fast the hamstring can't keep up with the quad powering yeah. them forward, and that's where it goes. Pop. So common, and that's yeah, why wide receivers, yep. uh, outfielders, you see that all the time, and, it, and it's because we put so much focus. On the front, on the quads, right. and they overpower, and then the, the camp can't keep up. chain is, is is essential for keeping you healthy and, and uh, injury free. You know, yeah. I, and I think the the answer to this is just never should your workout not include, you know, either stiff legged Romanian conventional deadlifts, some uh, kind of or, a hip or, or good mornings mm -hmm. should be in there, uh, and. Do not put a lot of energy and emphasis on all the machine hamstrings, yeah. the seated yeah. hamstring curls, the line. Not that they don't have value. No, they're great. Yeah, if you did the other stuff. That's right. It, yeah. It's a great way to complement all those. But you know, and and I'm guilty of this as a young kid lifting that you know my hamstring work was just the two or three hamstring machines because yeah. I never deadlifted or did any of those hard exercises. But boy, nothing developed my hamstring. I'll you know what else brought my hamstrings up actually that um, was later was when I started uh, deep squatting. Oh yeah, I actually was really. There's surprised. actually decent activation at a deep squat. Yeah, yeah. I, I it was something I wasn't looking to get or uh, from that, and it I was like a side effect that when I started uh, squatting, where when I worked on my depth and got to a t place where I could get really deep squats, I actually would get sore hamstrings yeah. a lot. I thought, oh, that's really weird. I've never had that from squatting. Always my quads yeah. and glutes, but never do I feel my hamstrings. But once I got into a, a really deep squat, my hamstrings got a lot of work here's, too. Here's one of the best two exercise combinations I've ever done for hamstrings for any client and in myself, and it produces tremendous gains. Romanian deadlifts, and then physio ball leg curls. Oh, those are brutal. Physio ball leg <laughs> curls. First off, here's why I like them better than machine curls. Now, it's true you can't load them the same and all that stuff. I get that. But here's the difference. You activate your hips at the same time. Yes, because yeah. if you're in, first off, if you do a machine leg curl, especially the one where you lay on your stomach, if you really want to feel in the hamstrings, what you need to do is pull your pull your thighs off the off the pad. So what you're doing is you're, you're activating the glutes and then doing the hamstring curl. 
and you'll feel the hamstrings versus what people tend to do, which is they stick their butt up mm -hmm. and hit their hip flexors while they while they curl with the hamstring. Yeah. Try it the other way and see what happens. When you do a physio leg, uh, physio ball leg curl, it promotes that. You have to. Yeah. You have to shoot the hips up and get that squeeze uh, all the way through. Do that after Romanian uh, deadlifts and watch what happens. Oh, to your and, and if you think it's too easy, progress it to a single leg and you'll just destroy oh, forget it. it. Who can yeah. do that? Yeah. Yeah. Hard. Next question is from Nate Brown Fit. How do I increase grip strength so I can deadlift more? You know, I we get a lot of remarkably, and maybe I guess it's not surprising anymore because it's been happening so so often. But we get a lot of questions on grip strength. I and I didn't see strength. that coming, but when we started yeah. this business, I'll never forget when you made that that yeah, forearm video. Yeah, Sal made that video on YouTube. We were giving him grief. About I it. Like, did, I thought it was stupid. Really I'm not gonna lie. I really thought who is gonna be searching for forearm and yeah. you know, grip strength shit? Can we yeah. please preface this? Uh, YouTube, uh, you know, this clickbait YouTube that we're doing right now <laughs> before that we all agree that nothing is going to develop forearms better than just lifting some heavy ass weight. Yeah. And I guess maybe just the type of clientele I had, or I don't re remember a lot of clients asking me that, but maybe this is, and maybe that's because we, we tend to attract people that are already into fitness and working out that this is something that well, someone's been training for a while and they find that this is yeah. a, a, a lagging. Well, there's two things, two reasons I would, these are my two guesses. One is, um, especially if you're doing heavy pulling and deadlifting and you're, you don't work in construction, you're not, you're just a normal person, which th these days that means you do nothing that's physical really in your everyday life. Then you go start working out and you have the weakest grip and that mm -hmm. becomes the weakest link. Mm -hmm. So then you're like, oh my God, what, what can I do to strengthen my grip? The other reason I think is because for the most part, if you're a man, um, the muscle that might show is your forearms and hands. And you ask any woman, and she'll say she checks out a man's hands and forearms and can tell if he's fit or strong from that. So it's something that's also uh, attractive. But anyway, <laughs> what I wanted to talk about were exercises because a lot of people don't know grip training exercises. They're not vi very common. I mean, we all know hold on to a bar as long as you can. Okay, that's great. That's one way to do it. Farmer walks. Okay, that's another way to do it. But really what you want to do, because when you're holding something for time, it's an isometric exercise. And the mm -hmm. best way to train isometrics is to train them in different ranges of motion. Okay, so to give a different example, if I trained isometrics in squats, I wouldn't just hold the squat at the bottom. That would be one way to do it. But then I would do one where I'm a little higher and one where I'm a little higher and maybe one where I'm real low. So I'm kind of doing an, isometri an isometric in different ranges of motion. You could do this with your grip as well. So you have the bar circumference, you can use that. And then what you could do is you could use a plate where you pinch it with your fingers like this, or you pinch it with your fingers like this, or you take a thick towel, you wrap it around the bar. So now you have to take a really wide grip or you wrap a towel around a pull-up bar and see if you can hang with your grip like this. So essentially the key is to train your grip in different ranges of motion from wide to narrow to pinch grip to where maybe even where you're holding just with two fingers. And I borrowed a lot of this from the what I consider to be the people with the most, uh, I guess, well-developed and balanced grips in the world, which are rock climbers. If mm -hmm. you rock climbers have uh, maybe not necessarily the strongest grips, but they have the most balanced strength in their grips where they can, if you watch a really good rock climber, they can they can do the craziest positions with their hands, with their hands way out here, or just one finger gripping or real narrow or inside cracks, and their hands are so versatile. And if you look at the way they train their hands, it's through all these different positions and ranges of motion uh, that, that they use. Cool. So. That's what I would. That's those are the, those are the ways I would say train your grip best. I did want to bring this up, and this is something that I've kind of been holding on to. Uh, you know, Jim Smith, Smitty from mm. oh, yeah. Uh, yeah from DeFranco and CPPS. Uh, you know, went out of his way and wrote us a, a really amazing uh, grip strengthening and grip testing uh, manual. Uh, and actually in it, he goes into like thorough detail. And so there's like a couple different categories that he classifies some of these different exercises and techniques. And 
one of them is crush, pinch, support, levering, and then he gets into hand health. Yeah. And so, you know, there's That's great. And so it, it, it goes into all those different techniques, you know, when to apply them and then, you know, how to kind of test out and also the, the cool uh, heart rate variability aspect of testing your grip uh, before you get into working out just to test your stress levels as well. So that, that, is this, is is this going to be included in the next program that we release? Is that the plan with this? Uh, yeah. I mean, that's what we're going to work out is, is definitely we're going to be releasing this attached with uh, a product that yeah. we're going to put out. Yeah. Now, uh, is, now we talked about grip, but w when you talk about grip, you can't leave out the forearm. So the forearm, yes, it has the muscles that close and open the hand, but it also has the muscles that flex and extend the wrist and also uh, go laterally. Right. So this is all the levering. Part yeah. So if you strengthen the grip, that's great. But also don't ignore exercises that curl the forearm or extend the forearm and also exercises where you're working this kind of laterally with the forearms. All of that contributes to a really well-developed, strong grip. I also don't want us to miss the simple answer too, which is simply just deadlifting more will help this. Like, I, I've done a lot of the, almost everything that we just have talked about and have seen definitely gains in my grip strength from all the things we're talking about. But one of the, the, the greatest differences I ever saw was when I, when I was chasing after Sal with a deadlift, I had never deadlifted at that high of a frequency um, and volume. It'll build over, your grip. That's for sure. And I just, yeah. the, the forearms came up because I was always practicing the deadlift, right? I was, and then part of practicing the deadlift all the time included like the axle bar every mm -hmm. once in a while, included mm -hmm. heavy singles and doubles, included higher reps sometimes. And just because I was constantly gripping that bar and deadlifting with that bar all the time, my forearms got yeah. a lot stronger, especially for that specific exercise, yep. because there's a difference in saying like just getting overall forearm or grip strength yep. that is applied to all these different things but if it's specifically because i'm having a hard time holding onto the bar mm -hmm. for deadlifting you know one of the most simple things you could do is to just deadlift totally more. and for the other sure. thing too with the forearms and this is just my own anecdote or experience is they respond really well to frequency so often like lots of frequent yes. training not at super high intensity so and scale yourself so don't just jump into this because you will get soreness in your elbows you'll get tennis elbow or what's the other one called golfer's elbow or whatever um, so, but you can get those hand grippers they are really cheap and just kind of play with them throughout the day. Try not to overdo it, but frequency, you know, as you build up to it, man, like, like, you know, I've, I've used, I've talked about my dad before he's worked since he was a kid with his hands and his hands are so they're, they're freakishly strong and hard. I'll never forget once he was, we, we were at jujitsu and he's a 50 something year old man. And he's going against this big Canadian pro football player. And they were going. And my dad's got a judo background. so sorry. And I remember they broke grips. And my this was the whole class burst out laughing. Couldn't believe what happened. My dad's 180 pounds at the time. And this guy's like 320 pound dude, big dude. He reached out to grab my dad's gi. And my dad literally grabbed his hand and crushed it. And the guy tapped out. Hmm. And he was like, what the hell did you just do to me? And we were dying of laughter that this old man could crush his yeah, head to make him, strength. make him Just tap like out. Shirt, huh? That's right. And it's so it, it, the frequency, right? That's what it came from. Him working with his hands for his whole life yep. developed just that, that iron grip. Next question is from health reimagined 3000. If you're going to include running in your regimen, is it better to run before or after lifting? Yeah, Whichever one you want to be good at, that's do it. first. Yeah, that's the bottom line. You know that principle applies to lifting Priority. too. Yeah, what yeah. exercise you want to get strongest at? What body part you want to develop the most? What skill you want to do develop the most? You know, if your goal is endurance and stamina in running, you should run before you lift. If your goal is building muscle and strength, then you should do that before you run. And there's studies on this that show and that someone's going to be asking, well, what if I want to do both? Well, it's the one you care about most. Yeah. You know, yeah. Or, alter all or maybe alternate. Yeah. Oh yeah. That's, yeah. that's fair. You know what I'm saying? But, but I, I think that everybody, there's always something that's a little more important, right? Like I'm, I'm more focused on building my body than I am being really good at running, but I, I want to run really good too. So then that's going to go after I work out or you're like, I run, that's what I'm more into, but I also want to be strong and lift. Well, then you do that first. Yeah. Right? It's, mm -hmm. And it's true. Again, this is true for all programming. So if someone's like, Oh man, you know, uh, when I work, I work out my legs and my lower body, but my my butt doesn't grow or my hamstrings don't grow. If you train those first and then go into the rest of your workout, you'll notice better gains in that. Right? Uh, it's true for for the whole body. That's that. What is that? There's a, a term for it where your body adapts most to the thing you do. I guess uh, earlier in the workout, and it's definitely true for running. Now, I do want to say that that lifting and running can 
compete with each other with the signals that they send. So that means that if you do both a lot, you'll get some of both, but not a lot of either. So, and that's okay for a lot of people. They want to be well balanced. They want to have stamina and endurance. They also want to have strength and muscle. Then you do them both. If your goal is more towards the muscle and strength, well, you, you're going to do more of that and less of the running um, and vice versa. And there are studies that, that support, you know, kind of what we're talking about. Now, some people may say we're splitting hairs. I'd say probably, but if you do this all the time, you know, splitting hair starts to turn into a bigger impact, right? So mm -hmm. if you do it once or twice or whatever, not that big of a deal, but if this is how you always train, then the order of operation starts to make uh, a bigger difference. I would also say there's a, there's a little bit of uh, an individual variance here too. Like sometimes some people like, uh, they swear by like running a mile before they start their workout. It just energizes them and gets them ramped up. I guess for the if it's easy for you, right? Yeah. So and so so some people will swear by it, kind of priming them for getting ready to do a lift, and they find more energy. Other people will be like, "Man, every time I run before I work out, I just you my my lifts suffer. I'm just not as strong or what right. that." Which is, I think, most people are like that. But there are exceptions to the rule, and so some of this is a little bit on your individual preference. Do yeah. you do you feel better? You know, do you do you you, when you lift first, does it does it uh, really hinder your running to where you don't enjoy your run at all? So you have to run first, or vice versa. Like I mean, you, a little bit of that has to come into play. Well, also. I like challenging anybody in terms of even if like running is your priority to focus specifically on strength for a phase. Uh, just like if if you're just all focused on strength, you focus exclusively on conditioning and endurance and running. You know specifically as you know a period of time where you can devote getting better at the mechanics, the technique. Technique, That's a good point. And, and really just like honing in on that uh, to, to bring that skill set uh, back into the overall. But, uh, you know, your body really does like respond specifically to things if you can, uh, you know, stay within one type of adaptation. Yeah, I used to do it before and after, but it was because I had didn't have a driver's license when I was a kid. I, one of the first gyms I joined was the YMCA. Yeah. And I didn't run to it. I walked and ran everywhere. I don't, yeah, I, but I rode my bike, so it would be a thirty-minute bike ride before and after uh, my workout. Um, and so that's how I used to train when I was when I was a kid. Look, if you like our information, you'll love MindPumpFree.com. There's a lot of guides that can help you with almost any fitness goal, and they're all free. So again, it's MindPumpFree.com. You can also find all of us on Instagram. So Justin is at MindPumpJustin. I'm at MindPumpSal, and Adam is at MindPumpAdam. 